Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Um, my name is William Norris, and I'm the Communications and Creative Program Programming Director for the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about some of the ways we've approached developing um, products for different audiences at the orchestra, and how um, also the communications and marketing, marketing team has been involved with that. Um, I'm going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions, and hopefully you might be able to also share some of your own experiences in developing products for different new audiences. So I'm going to start off um, with a blog, uh, which is actually written by a gentleman down here in the second row, so I've already apologized to him for using it. Um, and um, this kind of um, blog really explores some of the um, sometimes frustrating aspects of concert going, um, which um, I'm sure we've all experienced at one point or another. So I'm just going to, three pages of blog, I'm just going to read through, and you can read it along with me. So, five o'clock. I leave work early to make my 6 p.m. dinner reservation. Six o'clock. I'm stuck in traffic and call ahead to get them to hold my table. 7.30. It's just as well no one wants dessert because it's time to pick up tickets. Dinner comes to $125, including tip. 7.35. I arrive at the venue straight into the will call queue. You can't get to the restrooms or the gift shop without a ticket, so I just hop on one leg for a moment. 7.40. I've got tickets, I've had a pee, and it's time to mill around with old people, all seemingly lost because the terms used to describe where you might find your seats are incomprehensible. 7.55. The orchestra shuffles on stage as if no one can see them. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, they are wearing tailcoats. I feel a bit underdressed in an outfit that only costs $2,500. People practice their instruments. In principle, I'm in favor of that, although this doesn't really seem like the time. 9.35. I need to pee, so the interval provides welcome respite. I don't know how all these old people manage. There's always a long queue at the ladies, but not at the gents. This seems to be true of all concert halls. Somebody should look into that. 9.40, there's nothing to do in the interval except top up on fluids, so we sit in the crowded lobby and I try to convince my plus one that Sibelius is a good composer. 10 o'clock, we're back inside. Pianist Yuja Wang comes on stage and redeems the whole affair with a rendition of Prokofiev's second piano concerto that I will never forget. At the end of each movement, we suppress the urge to fill the awkward silence with rapturous applause for reasons that no one can quite remember. 10.30, it's over. Almost everyone stands up to clap, then almost everybody leaves. 12.45, I'm at home and in bed, trying to sleep, but somehow plagued by the notion that my evening out cost $350, it took eight hours to hear 40 minutes of good music. I could have bought you just record for $10. Now, I've read this out because I think it's useful to have sometimes the obvious pointed out to you. We are all very used to going to concerts and sometimes get blind to some of these frustrating things, but if we're designing things for new audiences, we need to be very self-critical and to put ourselves in the potential new audience's place. Um, and one element of this, I think, which has been picked out in this, is that um, we shouldn't be shy to think of what we, about what we do as entertainment. It has to look good as well as sound good. Um, and to kind of um, back this up, I asked some of my friends in a completely unscientific test um, to tell me what they found frustrating about concert going, and here's what they said. So lots of the things you'd expect, cues at the bar, stuffy atmosphere, overly long concerts, um, uncomfortable seats, concerts that go on for hours, handbags on stage. Um, Orchestras ambling on in no particular order with players looking less than happy to be there. Um, not enough interval time. So, the games, some of the things that people find frustrating about concert going. So, um, a brief introduction to the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Um, we were established in 1986. Uh, we don't have a music director. We're uh, run by our players, and the musicians make all the artistic decisions. Um, we play on period instruments. And uh, we tour across the UK and internationally, and in London, our main uh, base is the South Bank Centre, the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the Festival Hall. Um, now, classical music is obviously, um, tends to be kind of something we do to pe people, the audience. And that's come sometimes because of the way it's, it's kind of programmed. So typically, the way programming works is that um, the music director or principal conductor makes the decisions. And the people at the top who make the, plan the programming decisions often are the people who perhaps least understand the audience or least engage with the audience. Um, they will tell the management what they're doing, and the chief executive and the planning department will put that into practice. Um, at some point, someone will talk to me and tell me what I have to market. Um, and then it's communicated to the orchestra and then the audience. Now, classical music is always going to be an art form. It's going to be more about the audience being on the receiving end uh, rather, being, rather than being involved in the creative process. 
But what we can do is to program accordance, according to audience needs and to find new ways for the audience to connect with the music and develop experiences that are tailored specifically to different audiences. So I'm mostly this morning going to talk about a project called The Night Shift. Um, we started this in 2006. And one of the interesting things about it is that from the start, it was a project that involved um, the chief executive, the musicians, but also the communications and marketing team. And we developed it from the start all together um, with a specific audience in mind. Um, as if it came about because of a few reasons. Um, firstly, we'd established a student scheme, which was called Attitude, and we thought it would be interesting to develop a product specifically for students. Um, we also had, had a concert series called Listening in Paris, and um, this concert series examined um, the time in Paris in the 18th and 19th centuries when audiences kind of changed from being um, actually quite raucous um, audiences who would talk and eat and drink and do all sorts of things in the concert hall, and how by the 19th century they'd become much tamer, the audiences we know now. And we played the music from the era, but then when the festival had finished, we realized that we hadn't allowed the audience to engage with the music in a different way, and we thought that would be an interesting thing to do to see what effect it would have on the audiences, but also on the orchestra. And as well as that, we'd have a, um, a long-standing desire to present an informal concert series. Um, now, at this point, I'd love to say we did months of planning and research and um, all that kind of thing, but we didn't. We just did it and then learned as we went along, and I think that's possibly a good thing. So the aims of the program were to attract a younger audience, aged 18 to 35, and an audience which is culturally active, but for some reason classical music isn't on their radar. Um, we had to think about who this audience were, what, why they weren't coming, um, what the barriers to them attending were, um, and develop the product for them. So just to run through what the night shift is, um, it's an hour-long concert, which usually starts at 10 p.m. Um, you can bring your drinks in, you can go in and out. Um, it's presented from the stage. We have a host who interviews the conductor, the guest artist, the musicians, sometimes takes questions from the audience as well. Um, we have uh, music beforehand in the bar, which is always not classical music, anything else not, not classical, and then a DJ afterwards. Um, it's after a regular concert, so we have a concert at 7 p.m. for our core audience, and then we have a night shift at 10 p.m. in the same venue. Um, and the two, the two events have totally different audiences. Um, and crucially, the night shift has the same musical integrity as any other orchestra event, so it has to be the same quality. We, we play complete works, we don't play bits and pieces, we play a whole symphony, although we may talk between movements. So really, it's about changing the presentation and the packaging, but not the music. Uh, let's see if it's going to work. So this is a short video just to give you a flavor of, of the event. <laughs> I do believe the younger men. So not the kind of thing I normally come to, but I literally loved it. Huge fan, definitely coming back. I really enjoyed it, it was fun. It's not often that you get to see this kind of music in this kind of atmosphere. Oh no, I absolutely loved it. It's um, great Baroque music. Um, it was just fantastic in a, in a great setting. And, and what I liked about it is that it was more or less crowd participation, not like the places where you were like the first album was so stayed in, but this was just fantastic. It was just glorious. <laughs> a little bit more casual. Um, so other reasons to present this series were to actually to enable the orchestra to perform in a different way. We were quite interested to see if we allowed the, the audience to behave in a different way, whether that would impact on the performance, and also to enable kind of encounters between different genres of music, so between what was happening in the bar beforehand to the classical concert in the middle to the DJ afterwards. Um, 
I'm going to talk briefly about how we marketed the series. Um, the first thing we did was um, develop a, a separate brand for it, um, the Night Shift, and a separate logo. Um, we realized that uh, Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment meant absolutely nothing to this audience. Um, and we could avoid some of the negative connotations that people kind of instantly have when they think of the word classical. Um, and also because people who don't know us actually think we're some kind of religious organization a lot of the time. So we wanted to uh, avoid that. Um, and we wanted to develop a different uh, tone and language as well. So we really need to work a lot harder with a new audience to explain what we do and what the night's going to be like. Um, so um, we also use lots of pictures of the audience because it's really important for this audience to see that there's people like them in the room and that um, they're not going to feel out of place. We, we had to go for a very different pricing structure because we had to remove the barrier of a high price. So it's a, it's a very low price. It's usually um, nine pounds in advance. Um, and you can also book tickets via text message. So that when you get handed a flyer outside an event at midnight, you can book your ticket straight away rather than go home and forget about it. Um, obviously, we targeted different channels. So we, we hand out our flyers at different kinds of events. We advertise online on Facebook and Spotify and so on. Um, and also what we try to do is try and be as engaging as possible with our marketing. So we have lots of little kind of um, stunts and kind of um, events that I'll talk about later to try and get people engaged with what we're doing. Um, this is just an example of some of the flyers we've done over the years. So we really wanted the flyers to be ambiguous. We didn't want them to say classical music um, straight away. Now, as I said, the concert itself is slightly more engaging than a regular concert because we do have a presenter and we talk to the audience and take questions. Um, but we were trying to find ways in which we can go a little bit beyond that and engage with our audience on social media before and after the concert and sometimes at the concert as well. Because um, audience these days, these days are not really content to be totally passive. They want to feel some kind of involvement in, in what's going on on stage. So I'll just run through some of these examples. Um, for example, we give the, uh, the um, audience um, disposable cameras and they can d document their evening and then um, they uh, give them back to us, hopefully, and uh, we develop them and post them online for them to, to share. Uh, we've allowed the audience to vote for a piece of music. We give them a choice of two uh, and they vote for the one they want. We give them cl clips to listen to and then we play the one uh, which is chosen. Uh, we ask people how the evening made them feel and get, get them to write it down, and take pictures of, of them, and again, post it on social media. Uh, we ran a competition called Pod Idol, and this was to find a new voice for our podcasts. Um, so people um, auditioned by uh, recording a few lines for us. Um, we selected our, fa our favorite 10, put them up online, and then let the audience vote for their favorite, um, which resulted in the highest number of views to our website ever. We've had mobile billboards. Um, we've, we've had two crowdfunding campaigns as well. Um, this, as I'll say in, talk, talk about in a moment, it was a, an entirely new audience for us, and we were interested to see if they had potential to be um, fundraised from as well. Um, and um, so we ran two fundraising campaigns, and these were for a, a pub tour uh, in London. So we, we toured uh, five different London pubs. And um, we raised a small but useful amount of money, but actually the most useful thing about it was that everyone who donated, whether it was five pounds or 100 pounds, had a real investment in the tour. And it helped motivate attendance and got them to share with their friends. And it generated a lot of buzz around the event. Uh, we've had temporary tattoos. And free merchandise, which might seem trivial, um, but um, the kind of real reason to have free merchandise is is to keep the brand alive in people's minds after the event and to keep them thinking about it every time they use their pencil or put their badge on, they're reminded of the event and hopefully of, of the fact they enjoyed it and that they want to come back. Uh, we've also developed a loyalty card. Um, this works like the loyalty cards you get in coffee shops. You get a stamp each time you come to the night shift. Um, after three, you get a signed beer mat and after six, you can have drinks with the orchestra backstage before the concert. Um, people are very keen on bringing their loyalty cards. And we've also had a remix contest as well. So we uh, released um, clips of a rehearsal, um, and people could download it, remix it, and then submit it in a competition. Now, uh, the results of the program is that um, the audience is very different to our regular audience, 82% age 34 or less, um, whereas our regular audience is pretty much the same, but 55 plus. Um, 
And, um, and between 15 and 20% are coming to a classical concert for the very first time. And even those who have been before that generally attend very irregularly. And one of the interesting things is that um, the, the night shift has a higher rate of reattendance than our regular concerts. Um, we've also seen a lot of growth in the audience. In the first couple of events, we really struggled to get an audience. It was really hard work to get um, a couple of hundred people there. Um, but now we've got a, a really solid audience base, um, and we can, we can often sell things out just on social media. Um, now the series has attracted lots of attention from researchers, and um, there was one particular um, student who um, came to us and used her, us for her PhD. And she took um, a group of um, people who had never been to any classical concerts before, and she took them to three different events, of which uh, the night shift was one, to test their um, reactions to them. And um, I'm pleased to say that we were the preferred concert format for, those, for these new people. Um, but what was interesting about this was that what they talked about, they said that one of the most important things for them was the uh, feeling of rapport with the, with the performers on stage. Um, what they didn't like about some concerts was that they, they said that it felt like it didn't really matter if they were there or not, that the orchestra would play in exactly the same way, even if, they, even if no one was there. But they felt that they had some kind of involvement with the performance, possibly because they'd been talked to from the stage. Um, they also said they, they found the existing audience in other, other concerts to be off-putting because they didn't understand the audience reactions, they didn't understand the way they behaved, and felt that they were apart from the rest of the audience. And they also said it was very important that the event was um, entertaining rather than educational. Um, and these are some quotes as well from a, a focus group that we did. Um, all of these people had previously never come to a concert and had expressed kind of negative preconceptions of classical music. Um, but they came to the night shift for the first time, and um, from the quotes we got afterwards, you can see that their, their um, preconceptions were turned around. We've also commissioned our own evaluation uh, of, of the program, and um, the, the really important thing for this new audience we found was that we had minimized the risk to them by making the concert short, by reducing the price, um, by having different types of music in one night, so even if you don't like one thing, you're going to like another, the fact you can come and go as you, as you wish. One of the things that people were really scared about was the thought of being locked in a room for two hours without being able to escape if they hated it. Um, it also showed that no matter what, what marketing we did, um, word of mouth was the most important way people heard about things. Um, people's preconceptions had been overturned, and most excitingly for us, they thought the event was cool. It's got, it's, the series has got some really good press, and it's also, importantly, got us press in places we wouldn't usually have appeared before. So this is a piece that was in um, the Evening Standard, which is London's uh, free evening newspaper, um, which doesn't really feature a lot of classical music, um, but to, be, to have a, a photo article in the news pages was a real um, great thing for us, and not something we would usually get. So I'm just gonna run through some of the kind of learnings and challenges of doing this. Um, Firstly, that you have, we felt, felt we really have to stick to our principles. Um, and the principle was that this was a new product for a new audience, and it wasn't for our regular audience. So when we first um, did the series, um, we, we struggled to get an audience. And everyone was saying, oh, we, sh you should be, we should tell our regular audience about this. We should get the friends of the orchestra to come, which would have been exactly the wrong thing to do, because we didn't want our regular audience to come, because they would have brought with them their ways of behavior. They would have shushed people. Um, and it, would have, it wouldn't have worked. So, um, we had to be quite strong-willed and say, no, we're not going to tell them about it and, um, and really stick to the, the principles of the project. We also found that negative feedback was very, very strong, um, as in it had more power than it should have done. So um, we, this, we had this moment on the concert nights where the um, regular audience comes out of the 7 o'clock concert and the night shift audience is arriving for the 10 o'clock concert and they kind of meet each other and there's music in the bar. And um, we found that our regular audience, some of them at first didn't really like this, the fact they were coming out of their concert of... Beethoven, and there was music in the bar, and there's always young people in the hall. Um, and we found that you know, one, one person saying, I'm not very happy about this, was, was, was very powerful compared to the fact we had 300 new attenders in, in there for the night shift. So we had to kind of work with that. And also, the other, the other thing which was, um, which was uh, a struggle at first was getting the um, organization to value the new audience. As I say, somehow the one person who com complained from our 7 o'clock concert was more important than the 300 people who've come to the late night concert. Um, I think one of the reasons it's worked is us being very persistent as well. Um, if we'd just done one or two events, we might have stopped and thought it a failure um, because we didn't really get it right until the third or fourth event. Um, 
And uh, I think that's a problem with lots of projects like this, that people do it once, and um, maybe they're not quite happy with it and drop it. But really, we've refined it and changed it every single event. Um, and also, because this audience expects kind of new things, and so we've had to really kind of um, develop it. Um, Evaluation has been very important as well. We do questionnaires at every event. Um, and we also do um, video kind of interviews with the, with the audience. And that's been really helpful, um, especially in getting funding for the series. It's, it's, it's funded by um, trusts and foundations, and, and they, they want that kind of evaluation. Um, and lastly, we, we had to be realistic about our expectations. Um, obviously, we're not going to get the same return on investment in our marketing as we would do for a regular concert. Um, but this is about a long-term a long goal, really. Um, so as I mentioned, the, um, this younger audience is, is quite fickle, and they always want new things. So we've had to kind of uh, develop the series over the years and to keep it fresh. Um, and so some of those things have been about taking it to new venues. Um, we realized that um, we started off doing them at the South Bank Center, which is our main home. Um, but we realized that some audience members are never going to come to the South Bank Center because it's a concert hall. Um, so we want to take it to other venues. Um, so we've done events at the Roundhouse, which is a venue which is uh, more used to rock and pop um, events. Um, to Wilton's Music Hall, which is a beautiful kind of decayed, uh, half decayed venue in East London. And we actually had one there last night. Uh, Village Underground, which is a warehouse space in East London. And as I mentioned, also in, um, in pubs. Um, and we started doing the pub events probably about two years ago. Um, and they've been incredibly popular, both with the uh, audience and with the musicians. Um, this is quite a long quote, but this is from our leader, Maggie Faultless. Um, and she's talking about actually the way the musicians have benefited from this. Um, and as she says, the best performances involve a three-way relationship, the music, what's on the page, the audience, and the performers. The performers react not only to the written notes, but to each other, and most importantly, to the audience. But all too often in today's concerts, the third part of that equation is forgotten. Um, and the orchestra have really enjoyed being so close to the audience. Um, and in fact, we had, we had an event two nights ago, and and the, uh, lead, the leader came up to me and was asking me, is it working? And, you know, I'm not, not, not quite getting the feedback from the audience in the same way I usually do. Can I do something different? And it's just, it's really great that the uh, musicians are thinking about the audience and really feeling their reactions so closely. Um, just to finish, I'm just gonna talk about some of the wider impacts uh, of doing the night shift for us. Um, firstly, um, it's allowed us to be probably more adventurous that with our general tone and imagery. Um, I think by doing the night shift, it's, we've, it's allowed us to be a bit braver. So we've developed campaigns for the orchestra that feature the audience. And this is for our core concerts. Um, and these are actually audience members um, from, 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 our, from our regular concerts we recruited. Um, but also what's interesting is that um, the, or, the orchestra and the guest artists and the conductors have actually commented that the night shift audience is probably the most engaged audience they've worked with, and actually the quietest. And it's something odd about telling people they can behave how they like and they can bring their drinks in and they can come and go. But actually, it's, they end up being quieter um, and because they're engaged with the performance. So what we're looking at now is what elements we can take from the night shift to our regular concerts to make our regular audience more engaged with what we do. And I should also say I've got a whole pile of um, brochures and um, marketing materials with me if you'd like to see any of them. Um, and it's also... Um, we've also developed a, a kind of second series as well because when we did our research, we were surprised to find that um, actually a lot of the people coming to the night shift were older than we expected. They were kind of aged 35 to 55 plus. They had the same negative preconceptions of classical music as the rest of the audience. In fact, their negative preconceptions were probably stronger. Um, and they'd been brought to the night shift by their sons and daughters, which is a kind of reversal of how it usually works. Um, and they really enjoyed it. They, they, they got a lot out of it, but they, for them it was too late. Uh, it, it was too, it was, they felt old, um, too old for the rest of the audience. So we developed a, a second series, which we called The Works, which is kind of like the night shift, but a bit more structured in the early evening and really aimed at the kind of 35 plus audience. Um, so that's the end of me talking. Um, and so I think it'd be nice now, if you've got any questions for me, I'm very happy to answer them. But also, if you have any experiences working with um, different audiences, younger audiences, it'd be great if you could share them with the rest of the room. Thank you. A question about the audience you mentioned, your regular audience not coming. Do you have some of those audience members, though, that do come and love both of the two offers that you give? Um, we do, yeah. Um, especially some of our regulars were quite curious about what was going on. Um, 
Um, and actually, what we, what, actually, one of the important things I didn't mention, actually, was actually we did communicate this to our regular audience. But we kind of made it clear this is happening, but it's not for you. Um, and someone did come and said, oh, you know, I felt out of place. And I took that to be a compliment, really. Um, and in terms of the other way around, the other question I often get asked is, do attenders of the night shift then go on to you know, 7 o'clock concerts? And, and the answer is, um, they may do, but we don't encourage it, because the two products are so different. Why would, we, why would you come to a, a night shift and then come to a, a, a much more formal event? Because um, you're, still, you're still hearing the same music, so you're still getting the same quality. It's just the, different, the surround which has changed. Um, well, I wonder if uh, you could touch on the business model, because clearly we know that the business model of classic music is every concert loses money. <coughs> Since you're putting on concerts with a lower ticket price, I assume you lose even more money. So maybe you could explain how you square the circle. Um, yeah, that's correct. Um, well, we, we, we gain extra funding for this, and it's, a, it's an appealing project for funders because it is different because it gets a new audience. So we have um, funding from um, tr uh, trusts and foundations um, to make up the gap. Um, but actually, with some of the things we've been doing with the, with the events in pubs, obviously it's only three to five musicians, and those, those have actually become self-funding. Uh, we can just about cover our cost with ticket sales. Um, and we're also looking at ways we can make the product kind of commercial. So by doing um, small events for corporate clients, uh, we can make a profit, which we then um, use to subsidize the, the main events. Hi, Will. Um, you mentioned that you refined the format over a series of events. I'd be interested to hear what mistakes you felt you made and what, what you learned from, from those as you went along. Yeah. Um, lots of it was down to getting the, the right presenter, actually. Um, we tried doing it ourselves at first and realized that really wasn't working. Um, so we, we got a professional presenter, which was absolutely fantastic because um, they could keep the time, that was probably the most important thing. And lots of conductors and artists are actually fantastic at speaking, but they need someone to shut them up um, after, after a while. Um, and someone who can also, because we, um, lot, the audience don't really have a lot of classical knowledge, who can actually say, oh, what do you mean by, by the tonic or um, by the overture, or whatever it is, to kind of pick up them um, on one, when they were speaking. And some of the other things we, we learned was um, to do with that interaction between the two audiences. So. Um, we had to think quite carefully about what the music was in the bar because we didn't, we didn't want to upset the regular audience coming out, and, but we also wanted something appropriate for the night shift audience, so we kind of moved to more acoustic music in that slot rather than amplified music. Um, and definitely, actually, with the pub tours, the space, finding the right kind of space is really important as well. Um, kind of a room like this was the wrong kind of room for a, a pub event, like an end-on kind of situation. We wanted things where the orchestra could be in the middle um, playing with the, with the audience around them. Because um, otherwise, people kind of get disengaged and start going to bar, and, you know. Um, so, it's a, yeah, it's a few things we learned. You said that uh, the performers uh, perform differently. I'd like to know how that happened. I think they're just a lot more relaxed. They've already done um, probably, say, the symphony once at seven o'clock, and they're doing it again at at um, 10 o'clock, and they just kind of let their hair down a bit. Um, and often, actually, conductors have often remarked that the 10 p.m. performance is better than the, the 7 p.m. Um, that's the main difference, I think. Um, and they, you know, they enjoy interacting with the, with the audience as well, especially afterwards. They usually come to the bar and, and meet the audience. And um, I think um, both audience and orchestra have really enjoyed that. Um, and also, they've started to get much more involved in designing kind of the events or the pub events. Um, they've kind of designed ways for the audience to interact with, with the music, for example. I mean, this is usually just the encore at the end of the night, but um, we have a drinking song, for example, where every, every time the, th the theme comes around, you, you have to have a drink. But they've, the, the musicians have designed those kinds of things, um, which I, they've really enjoyed. Hi, Will. Um, you've, got, you've got your mainstream concert you have your night shift, and you have the works. Do you foresee a time when all of those things will merge into one to make uh, a concert format that is appropriate for everybody? Um, no. <laughs> I, th I, think, um, I don't think it's possible to make a concert format that's suitable for everyone, because I think everyone has very different needs and tastes. 
Um, and I think that's was one of the things that's maybe been difficult about this because not everyone has a, agreed with that premise. Um, but I think that um, in saying that commercial products are, are, are kind of developed for different kind of audiences, we've developed a concept formats for different audiences, um, and that the, the needs of uh, one group are very different from the needs of another group. Um, and there'll always be some people who want the traditional concert experience that starts at seven or seven thirty and lasts two hours, and is just the music and is that kind of um, reverential experience in a way. Um, but um, no, I think if anything, I think we'll be going the other way and that we'll be developing, as in we already have, but different, different discrete products for different audiences. And do you feel that that's the way, you, uh, for example, symphony orchestras should be trying to work? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I don't think, it feels like, for me, um, the 730 concept works least well for, uh, for, for, my, for my kind of generation and lifestyle. I, I think that um, it's almost like the worst of all worlds. Um, so um, I, I would like to see more variety, yeah. And one final one. Did your uh, core audience actually complain about this um, rigidly? Not a lot. I mean, there were some complaints, as I mentioned, but not a huge amount. And um, a couple of years ago, we did some research with the friends of the orchestra. And the, um, the researcher said, I want to ask them about the night shift. And I said, oh, God, do you have to? Because that's going to open up a whole can of worms. But actually, um, the response was really positive from the friends of the orchestra. And they said, we, we, we know why you're doing this. We think it's a good thing. It's not for us, but we're glad you're doing it. So um, I think um, they've actually come, really come around to the idea. Take this one first, quickly, so then. Um, can you speak a bit more about the actual music that you're performing, the repertoire, mm -hmm. and what works particularly well? We've performed um, pretty much everything. I mean, we haven't... Um, there's some things which we thought wouldn't work. So when we did Monteverdi Vespers, we didn't think that would work very well while people are drinking beer, really, um, in the hall. Um, but the interesting thing with this audience is they don't know much about music, so their decisions are not really based on repertoire, but by the fact it's the night shift, and they've come to trust the brand and know it's a good night out. Um, so it, in a way, it doesn't really matter whether we're playing Tchaikovsky or Vivaldi. Um, the audience will, will still come. It's, it's, we've found that some things resonate with them more than others. Like, for example, they seem to love Purcell. It has some kind of direct emotional connection. Um, and we've also programmed some new music in, in the series as well. For our last pub tour, um, we commissioned three young composers to write five-minute pieces um, expressly for the pub context. Um, and that worked really well. And I think the audience really appreciated having, having the composers there they, they could talk to and interact with. Hi, William. Um, thank you for your exposition. A couple of nights ago, I was in, in Madrid um, uh, attending a presentation for the the next uh, season for the Orquestra, uh, Orquesta y Coro Nacional de España. And uh, actually I was very happy because they have been working on a whole new project, um, planning things a little bit like uh, as you have done. So, and, and I'm particularly, uh, I'm particularly um, happy about this. But, um, however, during, during that, that presentation, some people were criticizing because um, there were some great ideas from my point of view as, for example, taking the orchestra to Museo Reina Sofia, for example, uh, and make like 30-minute um, concerts in other styles of music as well as jazz, for example. And, and even in, with, with all this new creativity coming in, uh, there were some people criticizing it. And I wanted to ask you, uh, from your personal experience, um, do you have uh, uh, how how have you reacted to this? And is it in the United Kingdom, for example, or uh, is it very complicated to come up with new ideas? For example, in Spain, generally we are always complaining that um, no one attends classical music. Uh, just an eight percent of the population goes once a year for on a, on a concert. And and I wanted to ask you what's the the sort of the way in which people in the United Kingdom generally accept this, this sort of, of, of new ideas. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the first part of the question, we have we've have had criticism. I guess some people don't like it, and that's fine. Um, I, I, I don't mind people not liking things. It means it's better to have an opinion about something than no opinion. Um, but I think the, the, co the crucial thing about this is about does, does it fit with the orchestra's mission? Does it deliver what we're supposed to be doing? If the orchestra suddenly started playing 
music that wasn't part of its commission, then I, would, I could see that would be a valid criticism, but we're still playing Beethoven on period instruments um, with fantastic guest artists and conductors, but just in a slightly different context. So I think for us, that, 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 that's, for me, that's usually the answer I give to people. Um, and also, I think um, in London, it's, it's obviously a huge amount going on. There's a lot of competition. There's, there's, there's countless orchestras. Um, and I think one of the things that's helped with this is actually it's become part of a kind of quite a, a movement for kind of informal classical music. There's other nights going on, uh, like non-classical, um, where they're presenting um, often contemporary music in different contexts, in pubs and things, or in clubs. Um, so it feels like it's part, and there's also um, the Yellow Lounge has come to London as well. Um, so um, it's kind of worked in that kind of context of, of different club nights and different kind of alternative classical nights. So um, it's been, I think, quite accepted like in the London kind of market. You mentioned about the um, audience for Night Shift being a little bit more fickle, but you must have some Night Shift diehards as well. H what sort of percentage, because you've been going for eight years now, have you got a, have you, you've got a, starting to get a core audience for Night Shift mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. And that's also the, the percentage of people who've seen the orchestra before is 60%, which maybe you wouldn't, is not as high as, who haven't seen it before is 60%, so it's maybe not as high as you'd expect, but that's because that's after eight years, people have come back again and again. I don't have to hand the percentage of people who've been a certain number of times, but we, there's been quite a few people who've got all six stamps on their loyalty card, so. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's quite an achievement. If you probably didn't really set out to do that. Um, no, we, to be honest, because we kind of did it so quickly, we didn't really have expectations at the start. We just thought we'd try it and see how it went. And it's evolved into this thing we've been doing now for eight years. So um, it's, we've been pleasantly surprised with how kind of loyal the audience is. And there's cert certain, there are die-hard fans who, who look forward to everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Merlijn Twelfhoff. I'm a composer, and I'm heard you also mentioning that some composers are involved, even they are not, I presume, from the age of the Enlightenment. Um, so uh, can you explain a little bit why, what is the essential difference of a contemporary uh, piece performed uh, or an old one? And also, did you ever, ever dare uh, uh, touch a score or like cut or modified, well, you, you said we respect the original composition, mm -hmm. because did you ever touch it? Did you ever? Uh, no, the yeah. only time we've done that is um, we, we have an hour, an hour to fill, and um, sometimes and so what we usually do is repeat the symphony from earlier on, and sometimes to, to, if we've got spare time, we'll do a, one movement from, say, the concerto if a, if a soloist, but other than that, we always perform the whole thing uncut and untouched, because that's, that's what we do. Um, and in terms of the new commissions we had, um, so we asked three young composers to write five-minute pieces that responded to the rest of the program, which was all Haydn, and that was um, funded by Sound and Music, who I think are here at this conference. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that worked very well in the context of the, of the, of the program. Because is there a reason not to touch the score? I know in theater, it's the most common thing to cut in Shakespeare. Uh, but in, in music, it seems uh, really blasphemy to touch it. Do you have specific reasons? Well, because we, we specialize in authenticity and period performance, so I think as it would kind of go against the, 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 the mission of the orchestra somewhat to start tempering with the score, but um, I think for other orchestras, that would be you know, an acceptable thing to try. Okay. We've got, so we've got five more minutes. Is there any other questions? Oh, if not, we can all have an early lunch. Uh, we'll go for an early lunch then. Thank you very much. Yeah.